Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for bringing us tonight together to have a Bible study in your presence. We thank you because you grant us the help and the unction and the instruction of the Holy Spirit every time we come. We're asking, O oh Lord, that the important subject we're looking at today, your Holy Spirit will write indelibly upon every heart in Jesus' name. We pray you grant us the spirit of understanding and the spirit of the fear of the Lord, so that, Lord, what we hear from you will fear your name enough and fear your glory enough and fear your person enough to follow through and be obedient to you in Jesus' name. As you encourage us and warn us and at the same time, you are telling us of your love. We we'll pray, Lord, that our hearts will take hold of your love. And we'll come into your kingdom in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer to our prayer. In Jesus' name, we pray. A good day. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Well, today we're in Revelation chapter 9. And we're looking at Revelation chapter 9, reading from verse 1 all through to verse 12. Before I read those verses to you, I want to remind you that all these events we are studying now, they are part of the outpouring of the wrath of God after the rapture has happened. That is, the Lord has concluded, in a way, the story of redemption. In a major way, the church age has come to an end, and then the church has been taken to heaven at the time of the rapture. The inhabitants of this world then will begin to face some terrible, terrible things. By this time that we're studying now in Acts chapter 9, they would have already realized and known that this is a great day of his wrath that has come. If you look at their language in Revelation chapter 6, reading from verse 16 and verse 17, and they, and they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand by this time now the people of the world will be realizing that they will not be able to resist effectively the power the might and the wrath of the almighty god being poured upon this world and at this time now that we're looking at, we're actually looking at the opening of the final seal. The final seal is a seventh seal. And in that seventh seal, you have seven trumpets. As the angels blow the trumpets, then some calamities come upon the people of the world. Do I need to remind you that the, the, the solemnity or the, the gravity of the, of the trumpets that will blow, uh, they were indicated in chapter 8 verse 1, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. That is, these seven seals contains actually seven trumpets. We have studied last week the blowing of the first and the second and the third and the fourth trumpet. And what you have seen there is that as the trumpets were blown one by one, devastations came upon the world, destruction came upon the world, death came upon the world, and all the pollutions of the ocean and the sea came upon them. You see, in verse 7 of chapter 8, and the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. So then, as the first trumpet sounded, and I reminded you last week that when the blowing of the trumpet actually signifies a lot of things. And one of the things it signifies is warfare. And therefore God will be at war with the people of the world at this time. And you see that when the first trumpet is blown, you see that uh, the, the trumpet then brought to pass the burning of a third part of all the trees in the world and all the green grass in the world. And then it says in verse 8, and the second trumpet sounded, and as it were, a great mountain, a ball of fire, burning with fire, was cast into the sea. And a third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea, and that life died. And a third part of the ships was, they were destroyed. And so you see that one by one, one after, after the other, as the trumpets are being blown, then you have some real terrible, dangerous things happening in the world. And then we have the third angel in verse 10 that sounded. And they are fairly great stars. 
from heaven, born in a sea to a lamb, and it fell upon the salt part of the rivers and, uh, and upon the fountains of waters, and the name of the star is called one wood. That is, they became bitter. And the salt part of the waters became one wood, became bitter, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And you see that uh, thousands and five millions and billions of people will be dying at that time because of the devastation that will be coming upon them as the trumpets are being blown. We're told in verse 12, and the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was meeting, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Now, as you see all those things that happen upon the people of the world, you will think that, ah, this is terrible. This is mightily terrible. Who will be able to abide this? And just at the time they were thinking that the greatest and the mightiest and the most devastating judgment had come upon them, then an angel was flying all over in the sky, in heaven, announcing to them, saying, how many trumpets have blown? One, two, three, four. How many trumpets are supposed to blow? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven minus four, many. Three. There are three trumpets here to blow. And those three trumpets here to blow are devastating. That's why the angel said, Woe number one, woe number two, woe number three. Fifth angel, there's a terrible woe and calamity. And the sixth angel, there's a terrible woe and calamity. And there's a seventh woe, a seventh trumpet. And there is a terrible woe and calamity. That's why you find in, in uh, Revelation chapter 8, verse 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, number one, woe, number two, woe, number three, to the inhabitants of the earth, by the reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. And it is the first of those woes we're looking at tonight. And that's why we titled this message, Divine Wrath with more severity on unrepentant sinners. At the opening of the seventh seal, the trumpet of judgment will begin. And then it says, it, at the end of the fourth trumpet, which I've just read to you now, an angel flying through the midst of heaven announces more intense and more fearsome judgment, saying, Whoa! Woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. The three remaining trumpets then are usually called woe trumpets. So if you split that, the trumpets of woe. I just say uh, to remind you, to refresh your memory, in Jeremiah chapter 4, Jeremiah chapter 4, I'm reading to you there from verse 19, Jeremiah chapter 4, reading from verse 19. It tells us about the significance and, the, and uh, the importance of that symbol of the trumpet in the vision that we're looking at today. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 19, my bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart, my heart maketh a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because thou hast heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. So, as these trumpets begin to blow, what the trumpet signifies, telling us that God in his wrath, God in his indignation, God in his fury is at war with this world because the bride or the bridegroom had been taken away from the earth. The church had been taken away from the earth. All that remains for the world now will be the devastation, the destruction, and the death that will come upon the people during the time of that great tribulation. Now you can come to Revelation chapter 9. As I read to you from verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I heard a star fall, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpion of the earth as power and it was commanded that it should not hurt the grass of the of the earth neither any green thing neither any tree but only those men which have not the seal of god in their foreheads and to them it was given that they should not kill them but that they should be they should be tormented five months and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion which striketh a man and in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall 
shall desire to die, and they shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were seat were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had the hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle, and their tails like unto unto scorpions, and their and they were sting, and they, there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months, and they had a king over them. Which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his name is Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. The fifth trumpeting uh, judgment described in this passage, which we just read now, will bring terrible calamities upon the earth by an intense army, immense army of locusts. First, his tie is seen to fall from heaven. That he is his spirit personality. And to him is given the key of the bottomless pit. He opens the abyss. That he is the bottomless pit. And then comes forth an innumerable swarm of spirit locusts that darken the sky. And they go forth to torment sinners living on the earth. These locusts are extraordinary beings. They are demon personalities. And they combine in themselves characteristics which are never found united ordinarily. Look at them. Each one has the appearance of a horse with a crown of gold on the head. And each one has the face of a man, the hair of, a, of women, and the teeth as the teeth of lions, and breastplates of iron, of, of iron, and tails like tails of scorpion. And it says they were hot men with, in a specified period of time, for five months, 150 days, and the people will prefer death to life, because death will be fleeing from them and be chasing after death. And that's what we're looking at today. Divine wrath. Because of the fury of God coming upon this world, because of the sins they have committed and they will not repent, divine wrath with more severity on sinners that refuse to repent. I look at this under three subtitles. Number one, tribulation and terror. Number two, torment and torture. And then number three, we have terrifying and threatening shape of the spirit locusts. Look at number one, the, tri the tribulation, the terror through the swarms of spirit locusts. The tribulation, the terror that will come upon the people at that time through swarms of spirit locusts. And let's go back to verse one. It says, and the fifth angel sounded. And I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Now listen to this. Uh, the star that is spoken about here, the falling star, the star that is falling from heaven, as the fifth angel sounded the trumpet. This is a personality. Look at this. It says, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star. And in the Greek language, when it says a star fall from heaven, that is a star which had already fallen from heaven. A star that had been displaced and deposed already from heaven. And it fell onto the earth. And then it says to him, which means to a person, that is the star that we are talking about. It's not a star in the sky. It's a personality. And to the star and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. The question is, who is this kind of star? This unnamed personality, unnamed star, is none other than Satan himself. Look at this. In Isaiah chapter 14, the falling star. Isaiah chapter 14, reading from verse 12. Isaiah chapter 14, reading verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? which deeds weaken the nations. It's talking about Satan, about Lucifer that had fallen from heaven onto the earth. And then John said, I, I saw the fall, as if it's just happening now, as the fifth angel sounded the prophet. Read on in verse 13, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars 
of God. The stars here above the angels of God. Above those extraordinary personalities that Almighty God has created who are standing before the throne of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of of the pit, the bottomless pit. That's the pit that is opened now. I come back to Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star. That's Lucifer. That, that's the devil. That's Satan. And that's the wicked one. It says, it's falling from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. I want you to look at the very fact that Jesus mentioned the fall of Satan when he spoke to the disciples when they came back after giving him the report that even the devils are subject unto us through your name. And he tells us in chapter 10 of Luke, verse 18, and he, and he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Are you learning something here? The devil had fallen a long time ago. And yet every time the Lord Jesus Christ manifests a glory, either himself directly or he manifests that glory through his own disciples or through his own people, it's like uh, that um, uh, that fall is reenacted again. It's repeated again. It occurs again. And we see it afresh again that Satan is falling from heaven as you come back to revelation chapter 9 verse 1 and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit to him was given the key of the bottomless pit just at this time and it was temporary because the lord was giving him some authorization at this time during the time of the great tribulation the key is eventually taken away from him before the end of the great tribulation because it was just for this period of the fifth angel sounding that the key of the bottomless pit was given to him how do we say that revelation chapter 20 in revelation chapter 20 i'm reading from verse 1 it says and I saw an angel come down from heaven. This one is not falling. This is a good angel. This is a mighty angel. This is a servant of God. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit. No more in the hand of Satan because something now is about to happen to Satan himself at the end of the great tribulation. And it says it's uh, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan. And he bound him a thousand years. Even the time of Satan, the devil, the dragon, the old serpent has come now for him to be bound. And to be sent into that bottomless pit. And it says in verse 3, and he cast him into the bottomless pit. And shut him up. And set his seal upon him. That he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years shall be fulfilled. After that he should be loose for a little season. And so we understand that in this uh, passage you are looking at now, as, this, as the bottomless pit is open, look at what comes out of that bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 9 verse 2. And he opened the bottomless pit. And there arose a smoke out of that pit, as a smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit, the pit. What do you have in that pit? Bottomless pit. It's so deep that you cannot fathom it. You cannot measure it. What's there in that pit? It says, uh, look at Revelation chapter 14. So for you to have an idea of what's in that pit, and how the smoke came out of that pit. It tells us Revelation chapter 14 from verse 10. And the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest night, day or night, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receives the mark of his name out of that pit we learn that uh, there is a fire there there is brimstone there there's sulfur there and because of the fire and the brimstone and the sulfur that the smoke is coming out and as that uh, bottomless pit is opened in uh, revelation chapter 9 then we're told that the smoke came out and the smoke was so terrific and so great it's like coming out of a great furnace and then it says even the sun was knocking by reason of the smoke that is coming out of that pit 
it. Well, you understand that at the time of the great tribulation, that's the time of the day of the Lord. When the deluge or the fury of the Almighty God will be upon the people of the world, we have been told already in Joel, that will be the time when the smoke will be coming out. And the smoke you see around today, sometimes when you see the smoke, you are going around and you are going on the road and you see some smoke, and that's nothing. That's little. This one will totally cloud the air and block off even the rays of the sun that is shining. We're told in Joel chapter 2. In Joel chapter 2 verse 10, it says, The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble, and the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw. They are shining. It tells us in verse 13, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And so, this great and terrible day of the Lord, that is the time of the judgment of God upon this earth, it will be a terrible thing upon the people on the earth at that time. And for those who miss the rapture, what a great, great, great regret they will have because they miss the rapture. Come back to Revelation chapter 9, and then you will see what came out of that smoke. Not only that smoke now, some things become to, begin to come out, and they are referred to as scorpions. It tells us uh, locusts. It says, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. During the time described in these verses, uh, you, you have seen that uh, terrible things will be happening. And it tells us that these locals, uh, they are not just ordinary insects of the insect variety. Because these, if you look at their description, these are demon locals. These locals of Revelation chapter 9, they will not eat grass. They will not eat any green thing. And they have a king over them, whereas ordinary locals do not have any kind of king, any king, any type of king over them. Now, when we talk about locusts, what are they ordinarily? Locusts ordinarily are insects. They eat grass, they eat vegetables, and if they come over a particular land, everything that is green, every leaf, every vegetable, all the backs of the tree, everything, they will peel up, and they will eat everything. Look at it when it came upon the land of Egypt many, many years ago, when the Lord was fighting with the Egyptians because they were unrepentant, because they were hard-hearted, and because they had rejected and refused the word of the Lord, let my people go, and they will not allow the people of God to go. So, one of the plagues and one of the judgments that the Lord sent upon them was the judgment of the plague of locusts in Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10, looking at it from verse 15. Exodus chapter 10, verse 15. For um, from, from verse 12, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the land of Egypt. For the locals that they may come up upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, even all that the hail has left. Even everything that the hail has left. It says, And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night and when it was morning the, the, the east wind brought the locusts and the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested in all the coast of Egypt very grievous were they before them there were no such locusts as they neither after them shall such be sold for they covered the face of the whole of the whole earth so that the land was darkened. You see, it was so thick and it was so many that when they were flying in the sky, these locusts, they darkened the face of the sky. And then it says, and they, and they did eat every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees, which at which the hill had left, and there remained not any green thing in the in the trees or in the in the herbs of the field through all the land of Egypt. As you read about that, you said, that is terrible. Yes, I agree with you, it is terrible. But the time that is coming at the time of the great tribulation, locusts will come. But it will not be ordinary locusts like the one you have seen in Exodus that will eat um, ordinary vegetable, ordinary grass or leaves of trees. These ones, they will not eat anything. They will just be stinging men, striking men. And when they strike, they'll put poison in the body of those people that they strike. And the poison will be like this poison of the scorpion. And it will 
will be for five long months, 150 days. Now it says these locusts were reading about in Revelation chapter 9, they have a king over them. As you look at the ordinary locusts, that is the, the, the insects uh, that you find that are called locusts, they do not have any king over them. As Proverbs chapter 30 tells us, reading from verse 24 through to verse 27, it says there be four things which are little upon the earth. But they are exceedingly wise. The ant are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet they make day their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet they go forth all of them by bands. That is the insects, the ordinary locusts, apart from this one that is extraordinary, that are demonic. Apart from these ones, the, the real locusts, they don't have any king over them. But look at the locusts here that we're reading about. As we look at Revelation chapter 9, reading verse 11, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is, in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue, his name is Apollyon. In English language that means destroyer. Now uh, we read about uh, about uh, these uh, locusts, and then we see the devastation that will come upon the world as a result of their presence on the earth. Uh, look at um, look at Revelation chapter nine. I'm looking at it in verse ten. It says, "And their tails like unto scorpions, and there was things in their tails, and their power was to hurt men." five months that's what uh, those uh, locusts uh, that's what they will do actually uh, if you look at their description which will come to later you'll see that these are extraordinary and these are terrifying these are fearsome you look at them even looking at them whether they are touching you it will it will send a signal in your heart in your bones in, in your brain that this is a dangerous time the sting of a locust is very painful unbearable indeed experts have written much describing the term of the sting of a locust. Here is what they have written. They have said, The tail of a scorpion is long and formed after the manner of a string of beads, the last larger than the others and longer, at the end of which are, are sometimes two stings, which are hollow and filled with poison, which it ejects into parts, into the part which it stings. Another person writes and he says, When the scorpion has stung a person, the place becomes inflated and hardened. It reddens by tension and is painful by intervals. That is, it will give a little pain, then relieve you, and then give pain and relieve, and then it will come in quicker and quicker su succession. And it rages, sometimes more and sometimes less. A sweating succeeds, attended by a shivering and trembling. The extremities of the body, like the extremities of the tongues, of, of the tongue, of the leaves, of the hands, of the toes, of the fingers, the extremities of the body, they become cold and the groin swells and the hair stands on edge at the on end and it says and the members become pale and the skin feels throughout the sensation a perpetual pricking as if by needles that's the kind of thing that will happen on the people at that time so the sting of the scorpion that will cause accused and dangerous suffering will come upon the people you ask yourself why do people have to suffer all this what do they have to go through all this when the mercy of god is available when the love of god is available when god is calling everybody today and he's saying come come let us reason together says the lord and then he will forgive your sin even though your sins might be as scarlet you'll watch them whiter than snow why will people wait until such suffering will come upon them well not everybody is wise not everybody is listening not everybody is going to accept the word of the lord that's why we're told in romans chapter 2 in romans chapter 2 reading from verses 8 and 9 but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness there will be indignation and wrath and tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the jew force and also of the greek and now the gentiles that tells us then all these people that will be on the face of the earth at that time there are people that will have rejected the gospel 
They have rejected the grace of God. They have rejected the mercy of God. They have rejected the love of God. While the mercy of God and the love of God was calling upon them, they rejected. They said, no, we don't want anything of it. Well, they don't want anything of it. Eventually, the wrath of God will come upon them. And you know, I've told you that as the first seal was broken, you saw what happened. Second seal and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth. And now the seventh seal. When the seventh seal was broken and then you have the seven trumpets and then the first and second and third and fourth, the people of the world, they thought this is terrible. This is terrible. But there's an announcement from heaven by that angel flying in the sky. If you think that everything you have seen from the first to the fourth, if you think they're terrible, wait until another war comes. And wait until another war. And wait until another war. Because it's like what Amos is telling us in Amos chapter 5 reading from verse 18. Amos chapter 5 reading from verse 18. In fact, Amos uses exactly the same language of war. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. And then he tells us it's as if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him. Or he went into his house and leaned his hand on the wall and the serpent beat him. Which one would you think is better? For a lion to meet a person, you say that is terrible but he's running from the lion and a bear meets him. Then he's running from that, he goes into the house and while he thinks that safety now. I will not uh, be affected by all the deluge of the fury of the wrath of God. During the great tribulation, he's leaning his hand upon the wall and a serpent bites him. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light? Even every, even very dark and no brightness in it at all. And so Amos is telling us it's going to be a terrible time. That's why every child of God should be a soul winner today. That's why, because you know the terror of the Lord. You know the judgment that's about to come. That's why you are warning everybody around you because we are told in 2nd Corinthians chapter 5, 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse 11, the first part of verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord will persuade men. And that's why you ought to intensify your evangelism because we know the terror of the Lord, that the rapture will soon take place and once the church is gone, the terror of the Lord will break forth and break loose and break forth into this world and then there will be terrible suffering on the earth, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. We're warning men, we're encouraging men to come to the Lord and we're persuading men. I come to point number two. The torment and the torture of the stings of the spirit locusts. The torment, the torture. When the locusts will be stinging them. And let's look at Revelation chapter 9. In Revelation chapter 9, I'm looking at verse 4. And it was commanded them that they should not, that they should not hurt the grass of the earth neither any green thing neither any tree but only those men which have not the seal of god in their foreheads here we're told that uh, these locusts were commanded by the lord that they should not hurt anyone except those who do not have the seal of god upon their forehead the uh, the devastations of these locusts would not affect the vegetation at all their warfare would be with men not with the orchards and not with the green fields and it says the spirit locusts will torture and torment all who do not have the seal of god in their forehead the frightening activities of these spirit locusts will be dictated by god and limited by the lord himself because it says it was commanded them that they should not hurt they should hurt only those men which have not which have not the seal of god in their foreheads that they should not even kill them but that they should be tormented five months these demon locusts will be sent to the world during the great tribulation to inflict unbearable torments and pain rather than take the lives of the people their torment would be very terrible it would be like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man and it says they'll be in their great multitude countless demons will be running unchecked throughout the earth during this time of the great tribulation and those who are left behind on the earth after the rapture of the church they will go through this awful severe 
experience. Uh, come back to this Revelation chapter 9 and you, you see that verse 4. It says, the Lord Almighty himself sets a limit on the activities and the stinging of these locusts. And you see it says, number one, they should not eat the grass of the earth. Number two, they should not eat the any green thing, neither any tree. Now it says, only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Do you remember that some of the Jewish people had been sealed? Uh, 144,000 of them. Those ones will still be on the earth. You say about the people, the Gentiles that give their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ during the great tribulation. We've shown you already in the word of God in Revelation chapter 7 from verse 9. Those ones, they have been martyred. They have been killed. And they appear in the presence of God in heaven. They will not be on the earth. But the people, the Jewish people that had believed on their Messiah, believed on Christ, and they have following after Christ, these ones had been sealed in their foreheads. In Revelation chapter 7 verse 3, Revelation chapter 7 verse 3 saying, Hot not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. These ones will be spared from the judgment and the fuel the wrath, the indignation that will come upon the people of the earth at that time. You say, why were they sealed? Why were they separated? Why were they so secured from the judgment? And other people were not so secured like them. Well, they are the people that actually follow after the Lord and they are crying and they are mourning because of the evil evil of the people around them. We're told in Ezekiel chapter 9, Ezekiel chapter 9, reading from verse 4, and the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh, the people that mourn, the people that cry, the people that are sorrowful, and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. You see, there are people that are so concerned for the glory of God, for the righteousness of God. And because of that, when you see people defiling the name of God and de denying the name name of the Lord and it, they, they, they walk abomination. It makes them to mourn and it says in verse 5 and to the others, he said in mine hearing, go ye after him through the city and smite let not your eyes spare let uh, neither have ye pity slay utterly both young, but old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. So the, the people that are unhappy, the people that are sad, the people that are weeping and crying, the people that are sorrowful because of the sinful condition of the world around them. Those are the people that are going to be protected from the devastation that will come upon the earth at this time. Now, it, it tells us in that Revelation chapter 9 that the people uh, sorry, that the locals, that is the spirit beings, the demons they'll be limited because it says they'll not take their lives. Look at Revelation chapter 9 verse 5. And to them it was given that they should not kill them. They should not kill them but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when it striketh a man. And there was the restriction given to these uh, spirit locals, these spirit beings that will be stinging the people with the uh, sting and the poison of scorpion and uh, they are told that they should not kill them that means that even the activities of satan are limited by the almighty god and the activities of demons are limited by the almighty god you tell me if during the great tribulation when the wrath of god is poured out without measure upon the people of this earth if almighty God will limit the activities of those demons and evil spirits how much more at this time that we're living now at this age of grace when the church is still here when the mystery of iniquity is working but cannot go to the full extent because of the presence of the church that means then even today the activities of demons are limited and the activities of Satan they are limited by the almighty God himself that's exactly what happened at the time of Job, in Job chapter, uh, Job chapter 2, Job chapter 2, looking at verse 6, and the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, is in thine hand, but save 
his life. Don't touch his life. You're limited in what you're able to do. Now, as you see that the scorpion will begin, the, the locust having the tail and, his, and the sting of a scorpion will be stinging the men. Uh, what will be the reaction of the people? What will be the feeling of the people? What will be the cry of the people at that time? Revelation chapter 9, and looking at it in verse 6, it says, In those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and they shall flee from them it says that at that time there will be so much uh, suffering that the people will prefer death to what they will be going through but uh, it's because they do not really understand that uh, although they, were, they will be going through some pain yet what they will be going through will be nothing compared to what they will go through when they get to hellfire but understand the situation at that time because the experience of the torment of those demon locals will number one be painful number two it will be protracted number three it will be personal number four it will be perplexing number one the, the experience of the stinging of the locusts will be painful the sting of the of the scorpions is one of the most painful stings known to man number two it will be protracted because the painful experience will continue for five months 150 days think about that without even a short intermission that is there will be uh, there, there will be no intermittent thing it's just there it's just there in the day and in the night and there is no injection and there is no cure about it that will be able to soften or lower or me or will be able to take the pain away in, in number three it will be personal every person among the inhabitants of the earth who does not belong to god will suffer from the sting of the scorpion tail of those locals and then it will be perplexing because the people were so perplexed why is it we're looking for death and death will not come and will seek to die but death will not be possible even for those who may attempt suicide the distress will be so great that men will consider death to be a relief though men would look forward to death as a release in reality when you think about it death will furnish no such relief at all for there are greater and more unbearable pain and suffering beyond the grave than there are on earth even during the great tribulation the only way of escape from the suffering of the great tribulation and the suffering of eternal hell is that the the people will seek the lord while he may be found but i want you to look at this experience that they'll be going through that it says they'll be looking for death they'll be looking for death and they'll not find death in job chapter 3 looking at verses 20 through to verse 22 job chapter 3 in job chapter 3 from verse 20 therefore is light wherefore is light given to him that is a mystery and life unto unto the bitter in soul which long for death but it cometh not and dig for it and search for it and is pursuing it more than he treasures which rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave and yet the grave will not be there for them and death will not be there for them in chapter 7 of job Job chapter 7, reading from verse 15 and verse 16. So that my soul chooses strangling and death rather than life, I loathe it. I would not live always. Let me alone for my days of vanity. Here is Job in what he went through. He was suffering so much and he said, oh, if I could die that would be better for me well if he had died if he didn't kill himself he would have gone to heaven because he was a perfect man a righteous man a holy man a man that pleased the lord but these people at the time of the great tribulation they'll be people that you know they are facing the fury of god and they are facing the judgment of god and they are righteous people had in sinners and they have not repented we died in that condition they'll still go straight to hell in jeremiah chapter 8 reading from verse 3 jeremiah chapter 8 i'm reading from verse 3 and death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of them that remain of this evil family that he is in this world in which we are living now after the church had gone the things that will come upon the people of the world all those people residue of the people the remainder of the people the people that remain behind when those things begin to happen to them they will choose they will want to die rather than live which remain in all the places whither have driven them says the lord of hosts we come back to revelation as we look at revelation chapter 
9, uh, chapter 9, verses 4 through to verse 6, uh, you see the thing happening to these uh, people. And you're asking yourself, how will God be so furious? How will God lay such judgment and uh, such, so much calamity upon them? And the Bible tells us, Revelation chapter 18, it's because of the sins of the people, because of their lack of repentance. That's why these things will come upon them at such a time. Revelation chapter 18, reading from verse 5, for her sins have reached unto her and God has remembered her iniquities reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her double according to her works in the cup which she has filled filled to her double how much she glorified herself and lived deliciously so much torment torment and sorrow give her for she has said in her heart I mean I sit as a queen and I'm no widow and shall see no sorrow and now sorrow is coming and devastation is coming upon them and the Bible reminds us in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 26, it's a warning for us, those of us who are alive now, because uh, the, the rapture can take place anytime. And if the rapture takes place anytime, uh, the Lord is uh, warning you and the Lord is telling you, if you are not ready and you are left behind, these are the things we will go through. In fact, uh, the people living at that time, you know that the people living today, not many of them understand the book of Revelation. They will not have read what we are looking at now and it will be coming to them as a surprise and when something happens and they feel that it's all over and we're going to have a relief and we're going to have a release another thing will come and then they'll hear the blowing of another trumpet and the blowing of another trumpet but you you have read all this you've learned all this you'll be more fearful than they will be if you will be on the earth at that time because while they are thinking everything is going to be over you'll be counting one two three four five six seven and when the seven the seal has been broken one will begin the trumpets and then when one two three four five six seven trumpets are blown at the seven trumpet there'll be the one two three four five six seven bowls again and you'll be counting you'll say we're still we're still having a long way to go and if you are left behind after the rapture of the church are taking place great will be your suffering and great will be your fear that will come upon you i pray that you'll not be left behind at that time in jesus name in hebrews chapter 10 i'm reading from verse 26 for if we sin we willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins after you have known about salvation after you have known about repentance after you have known of the grace of god after you have known of the possibility we can be holy we can be righteous we can be as pure as he wants us to be and escape the judgment coming upon the world after you have known all that if you sin willfully after you have come to the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a, fear, a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despises, that despised Moses' Lord died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now think about it of how much sorrow punishment. Suppose he, shall he be thought worthy who has trodden on the foot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy sin. The people that were sanctified before, set apart before, cleansed and purged and purified before by the blood of the Lamb, they turn back and they backslide. And then they began to blaspheme even the name of the Lord and begin to reject the gospel. And the blood of Jesus Christ that sanctified them before, they now count it as a worthless sin, a useless sin, something of no value. And then it says they count it as an unclean sin, an holy sin, and as none despite of the spirit of grace. For we have no, for we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, says the Lord. And again the Lord shall judge his people. Then it finds analysis by saying it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. When you read that today, maybe you don't tremble. You read that today, maybe you, you just shrug your shoulder. The people that are living, that will be living at the time of the great tribulation, they will realize that this God a loving God in the past. A loving God when the church was here. But now that the church is gone. The bride of Christ is gone. This is a fearful God. Indeed a God of wrath. Of indignation. Of judgment. It's a fearful thing to fall. Into the hands of the living God. What the Lord is telling us. Then is that at this time of opportunity now. When the Lord is saying. I can save you today. 
I can forgive your sins today. I can wipe away your sins today. I can turn you around today and put your name in the book of life. This is the time to seek the face of the Lord. Because he tells us in Isaiah chapter 55, reading from verse 6, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. This is the time of grace. This is the age of the love of God. This is the time when God is saying, Whosoever will call upon my name, I will save. Seek the Lord while he may be found, and call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the righteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon because he doesn't have any pleasure any delight in the death and the suffering of the sinner but that the sinner will repent and have the grace of god upon his life in ezekiel chapter 18 ezekiel chapter 18 verse 30 therefore i will judge you O house of israel everyone according to his way says the lord god what's the solution how can we escape that judgment of god that fury that indignation, that that wrath of god coming upon the world it says repent Turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dies, says the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. But for the people that reject that call of God, and uh, they hear from evangelists, they see from the Bible, they hear from soul winners, they hear from everybody, and they still reject, well, the deluge of the judgment of God and the wrath of God will be waiting for them as they spot out during the time of the great tribulation. We'll come to point number three, the terrifying and threatening shame of the spirit locusts the terrifying and the threatening shape of the spirit locusts i'm reading to you from revelation chapter 9 in revelation chapter 9 we're now in verse 7 as the bible as john describes the locusts that he saw he describes them to us in verse 7 and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold and their faces were as the faces of men and they had hair as the hair of uh, women and their teeth were as the teeth of lions and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle and their tails like unto scorpions and there were stings in their tails and their power was not to hurt men it was not to hurt men it was to hurt men five months their power was to hurt men five months. And it says, and they had a king over them, which is the a angel of the bottomless pit, that is, they had an administrator over them, a leader over them, instructing them. And, uh, you know, think about it. These uh, demon spirits have been in the bottomless pit, in the smoke, and in this terrible place uh, for thousands of years. And they had been suffering. You remember when Jesus wanted to cast out the legion of evil spirits? They said, don't send us to the bottomless pit. Don't send us to that place of torment. They were afraid. Are you going to torment us before the time? But these ones, these demon spirits that are coming out of the bottomless pit, they have been in the bottomless pit for thousands of years. And now they come out. You can tell then, these who have been suffering for thousands of years, they come upon men and they know they have only five months to torment them. It will be terrible torment they will unleash upon the people living on the earth at that time. And that's the reason it's not uh, it's not uh, going to be advisable for you to play with your salvation joke with your salvation and then at a moment the trumpet sounds and the rapture takes place and then you are left behind it will be a terrible thing look at their description the description of these uh, demon locusts is both terrifying and threatening their appearance combines various aspects of the horse of the lion of the scorpion of men and of women five together uh, can you think of a creature having some features features of women some features are features of men some features are features of a scorpion and some features of these creatures of lion and some other features are that are those of of, 
of, of the horses. These uh, demon locusts, number one, they'll be invulnerable creatures. That means they have so much strength and power and conquest. The conquest of horses that go into the battlefield that nobody will be able to con confront them and no insecticide will be able to destroy them. Number two, they'll be intelligent. That's why it says they are like men. They have faces as that of men. And they'll be looking for the men that do not have, the women that do not have, the children that do not have, the people that do not have, the mark of God upon them. And they're so intelligent. They'll strike them at the right spot that will give them the pain for five months. Number three, they'll be inhuman creatures. Inhuman because they'll have the teeth of lions. And you'll know that this is just, although having the face of a man, this is beyond a human, a human creature. This is inhuman. But then, number four, they'll be indestructible. Because these creatures will have the breastplate of iron and then number five they'll be intriguing intriguing creatures that means they'll provoke curiosity because they have the air of women uh, you know the people will be so intrigued they'll be so surprised and their curiosity will make them to even want to come out and even see what kind of creature is this you see the shape of the horse and you see the face of the man and you see the air of women and you see the tail of the scorpion and their curiosity making them to come out will make the uh, these uh, locusts to strike them more and then number six they are irresistible creatures because they have wings and when they make sound with that wing it is like the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle what pain what suffering will such a swarm of demon creatures cause men women and children on the earth when they are released from the smoking uh, uh, bottomless pit where they had been suffering for thousands of years and that's why the lord is telling us that this is the time to be ready this is the, now as you as you see the description of these uh, creatures i want you to look at joel look at joel chapter 2 in joel chapter 2 is telling us about uh, about these kind of locusts these extraordinary locusts that will come upon the face of the earth at this time of the terrible suffering in joel chapter 2 reading from verse 4 and verse 5 and verse 8 the appearance the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses as the horsemen so they, so shall they run like the noise of chariots on the top of the mountains shall they leap like the noise of of, of a flame of fire that devoured the stubble as a strong people set in battle array and then he tells us in verse 8 neither shall one thrust another they shall walk everyone uh, in his path and they, when they fall upon the sword they shall not be wounded that is none of those multitudes of demon uh, locusts will be killed and they will so maintain their rank and they will not fall upon one another they will not attack one another they will not eat up one another they will just be striking men and women and children that are left on the earth during the time of the great tribulation as we say it it may not strike you as anything but if you have been beaten by a scorpion before if you have been beaten or stricken a stung by a snake before you understand what you are talking about they will be much more much more terrible and then we're told about their strength the strength of the horse is what they will have in job chapter 39 Job chapter 39, reading from verse 19, having the strength and the ability of the horse. In Job chapter 39, reading from verse 19, as thou given the horse strength, as thou close his neck with thunder, canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He poised in the valley and rejoiceth in his strength. He goeth unto meet the armed men. He mocketh at fear and is not affrighted. Neither turneth he back from the sword. The quiver rattleth against him. The glittering spear and the shield. He swallows the ground with, the fierceness, and, with fierceness and rage. Neither believeth he that it is sound of, a, of the trumpet. He says among the trumpets are ah, ah and he smelleth the battle and fire of the thunder of the captains and the shouting. Uh, so that, that's how those uh, chariots, that's how those, uh, how those demon uh, horses will be. The demon locusts looking like horses. That is how they will be. And you see in chapter 41, chapter 41 from verse 46. From, chap from verse 26 rather. 26, the sword of him that lays at him, that lays at him cannot hold the spear, the dart, nor the Abagion. And then it says, and he estimates iron as straw, 
and brass as rotting wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. The sling stone are turned with him into stubble. That are counted as stubble. He laughs at the shaking of his spear. Sharp stones are under him, and he spread the sharp pointed things upon the mire. He is describing what it will look like when these indestructible, invulnerable creatures will invade the whole earth. And at that time, there will be terrible judgment that will come upon the people. Why don't you come back to Revelation chapter 9. In Revelation chapter 9, I'm reading to you now from verse 11. Revelation chapter 9, reading from verse 11. It talks about uh, the one that will lead these uh, demon locusts. And it mentions uh, that one as a destroyer, the Apollyon or the Abaddon. In verse 11, chapter 9 of Revelation, and they are the king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name name is whose name in the hebrew tongue is abaddon but in the greek tongue his name is apollyon he's talking about uh, the one that will be directing the that will be directing the locals that will be directing the demon personalities invading the whole earth is the devil himself because as we look at revelation chapter 12 reading verse 9 revelation chapter 12 reading verse 9 and the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and satan which deceiveth the whole world and it was cast out into the earth and his angels was, were cast out with him in verse 12 therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knows that he has but a short time the devil that will be controlling at that time controlling those uh, demon locusts he'll be in great fury in great anger, in great wrath against the people of the earth. And he wants to do the greatest damage he could do for the short time because he knows he has just short time. Now, as you look at Revelation chapter 9, Revelation chapter 9, it tells us in verse 12, one war is past. Behold, there come two more woes hereafter. The question is once again, woe, lamentation, evil, suffering, devastation upon the people of the earth at that time. But why? Why do they have to go through all this? Let me show you why. In Isaiah chapter 45, Isaiah chapter 45, reading there from verse 9, Woe unto him that says, who, that says unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, sorry, that's verse 10, What hast thou brought for her? Come back to verse 9. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. These people have been striving with their maker. They have been fighting with the, with the creator. The creator, the God of heaven has been saying, repent. Come unto me. I created you for my pleasure so you can do my will. They have been saying, no, I will not come. I will not repent. I will not give myself to the Lord. What can you do for me? I am feeding myself. I am doing everything I want. So what, what have I got to do with the Lord? Without believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, I have a house, I have a car, I have everything. And I am married and I have children and I am happy. I have a job and everything is going on fine for me. Why do I need God? Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say unto him that fashioneth it, What makest thou or thy work? Uh, he has no hands. The reason why these wars will be coming upon them is because of the neglect of the salvation of the Lord, which he has offered to everyone free of charge. That's the reason why they'll be suffering so much at that time. And when it is morning, they'll say, oh, if it were evening. Now, when it is evening, they'll say, oh, if it were morning. They will not be at rest at any time at all. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, Deuteronomy chapter 28, reading from verse 65, it tells us the experience of the people that will happen to them at that time. And among these nations shall thou find no ease. Neither shall the soul of thy foot have any rest, but the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind, and thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shall have none assurance of life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were evening, and at evening thou shalt say, Would God it were morning, for the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see 
And that's what will be happening at that time of the great tribulation. And my question to you is, how are you going to escape all these things if you are not born again? That's why I was asking you the question, what's your joy if you are not born again? What's your joy if you are not free from sin? What's your joy? Tell me what's your joy. If you are not sanctified, you are not holy, you are not made ready for the coming of the Lord. What's your joy if you don't have Jesus? Because uh, when the, after the church is gone, and then you are left behind with the people of this world, even the knowledge you have now will be a torment, a torture unto you. Because you realize, and you remember everything you have learned in the book of Revelation. Now the church is gone. Now the rapture has taken place. What am I going to do? And I, it's, it's going to be difficult. If I say that I will take my stand, I will not take the mark of the beast. I will not perish with the people, the unbelievers. The persecution is going to be so much, they are going to take my life. And then, if I, even if they don't take my life, I about the scorpion. I about the mountains moving. I about all the earthquakes. I about all the water becoming blood. I about the water being poisoned. I about all these various things happening. Then fear will grip you at that time. And if at that now, there is a pastor. There is Bible study. There is revival hour. There is Sunday worship. There is choir singing. There is chorus singing. There is everybody encouraging you to come, come to the Lord. And you don't come now at that time when we will not be here. Because the church, they would have gone. The people of God would have gone. Now that you are playing with your salvation and playing with this holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. What will happen to you on that day? Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Lest at any time we should let them sleep. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? How will you escape if you neglect so great salvation? The salvation that Jesus paid for on the cross of Calvary. The salvation by, for, for which he shed his blood. And he said, it is finished. And he says, whosoever will can come. And the Lord is calling you today. And he's saying, now you can come to the Lord. This is the time to come to the Lord. And the spirit and the bride say, come. You are not born again yet. You are still in the wilderness of sin. And the Lord doesn't want you to go through all this suffering. The spirit of God is saying, come. And we, the people of God, the bride of Christ, were saying, come come let him at us come and let him take of the water of life freely but if you keep on rejecting and rejecting and rejecting remember the day of grace will not last forever and ever one of these days as the trumpet will sound and the people of god will be called home where will you be on that day rise up and tell the lord where will you be on that day when these things will be taking place upon the earth where will you be when the locusts will spread over the whole land, where will you be? When they will be stinking people and they will be suffering for months and months, there will be no relief, where will you be? And when they will be crying for death and they will not see death, where will you be? When the church will not be here and the people that are left behind, there will be no grace and there will be no love and there will be no mercy. It will be judgment, it will be wrath, it will be indignation, it will be indignation, it will be suffering. Where will you be? When the saints of God are singing in heaven, where will you be? When the saints of God are rejoicing with angels in heaven, I'm telling I'm asking you, where will you be? When temptations over for the people of God, persecution over for the people of God, suffering over for the people of God, crying over for the people of God, and we see the king face to face because we settled the account long ago and our record became clear. Our sins were washed away because we settled the account of the Lord. Our sins were forgiven and our hearts were cleansed and purity, holiness, sanctification have been given to us and we live the holy life. And now we behold the face of the Almighty god in heaven and we're rejoicing ever and ever and ever where will you be at that time when the saints of god go marching in and we're marching in with them and we love the lord and we're rejoicing and all tears are wiped away from our own eyes and we're before the presence of the almighty god in heaven and we're rejoicing because we made it at last and we're before the throne of god with all the elders and with all the living creatures and with all the with the almighty god himself sitting upon the throne and the lamb of god and the Lamb of God welcoming us home and we're rejoicing forever and ever. No more tears and no more sorrow, no more crying, no more death for us and we're rejoicing at the presence of the Lord in heaven. Where will you be at that time? If you are not born again, where will you be? If your sins have not been forgiven, where will you be? If hatred is still in your heart and at the time that the rapture takes place, where will you be? If you're stealing and you have not made a restitution, tell me where will you be? 
If you are not holy and righteous before the Lord, at the time the rapture happens, where will you be? If you are fighting, committing adultery, fornication, at the time the rapture takes place, tell me where will you be? If you are hypocritical and you are coming to church but you are not living a righteous life, you know the Spirit of God is telling you, you are not a true believer, you are a hypocrite, you are a sinner, you are a hardened sinner, you refuse to repent. And the time when the rapture takes place and we are in heaven, tell me where will you be? You'll be lost forever because no sin will enter there. No sin will enter there. If then sinful spots, your soul shall man, you cannot enter there. The Lord is calling you today. This is the time of grace and this is the time of the love of God. And he's saying, come on home, come on home, come on home. The righteousness of the Lord and the mercy of the Lord and the goodness of the Lord and the grace of the Lord is still calling you today. Today you can come. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call you upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and a righteous man is us. let him call upon the lord the lord will abundantly pardon the lord is saying come 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 let us reason together says the lord do your sins be as scarlet he'll wash them as white as snow though they be like crimson he'll make them as white as well if ye be willing and obedient he shall eat the good of the land if you refuse and rebel well the rapture will take place will be left behind you'll go through the indignation the wrath and the fury and the judgment of god at the time of the great tribulation this is your only chance nobody can promise you tomorrow come to jesus today